deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fishing Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas Outdoor Nation. I'm your humble host, Dustin Von Warnke, back with another podcast. So excited to have you guys back on board this show, man. Without you guys, the listeners, we'd have no podcast, and there'd be no reason for me to turn on this microphone and talk into it every two weeks. And uh, I just really appreciate it. Without you guys listening to this show, there'd be no show. So thank you guys so much for doing so. If you've not done so already, please subscribe to the podcast. It is free. You get it every two weeks uh, right now. And uh, basically, it is kind of complimentary of um, your host here, Dustin Von Warnke, and the guests that I have on the show and Texas Fishing Game Magazine. And it's just more content that we're putting out there in the audio-only format, which is becoming ever so more popular as the time goes on, especially with the technology that we have today. And I'm just really excited to have the chance to sit down with you and um, talk about hunting, fishing, outdoor lifestyle, um, camping, hiking, all that stuff that goes along with it. Man, I just I dig this stuff. So I just uh, love this format to be able to share things with you. If you've not done so already, please subscribe to the podcast. It is free. And um, if you are listening on Facebook, if you're listening on um, you know uh, YouTube or anything like that, you can subscribe, obviously, through YouTube. But through Facebook and places like that, go to your mobile phone. Find the podcasting app that your phone has, Android or iPhone or Google Pixel or whatever you've got, and uh, just hit the old subscribe button on uh, whatever podcast app you find this on. You can find them on everything, anything from Spotify to iHeartRadio to uh, Podbean to, um, uh, you know, there's just the Stitcher uh, for Android. There's just a whole bunch of different podcasting platforms, obviously iTunes. Um, all those on there, you can get uh, this podcast and just hit subscribe. You'll get a new episode that's downloaded every two weeks to your phone, like this one was. And uh, just love, love, love to have you guys on board for future shows. And you can go back and listen to previous shows, by the way. If you want to find out what a show is about, just search the title. And most likely the title will have a little bit of everything that's going to be in the show. So... I try to keep my titles very, um, you know, to the point and relevant to whatever topic that we're covering, and um, I really think you will find some good information here. I've had some great guests on the show. I've got some great guests planned, and today's show, I've got Chester Moore back again, and Chester, I know I have him on the show a lot, uh, probably my most frequent guest out of everybody, but he is our editor-in-chief at Texas Fishing Game Magazine, our monthly magazine that comes out every month. Um, And uh, you get the digital version every month at fishgame.com, as well as our blog content, this podcast, and so much other stuff. Uh, And then our newsletters, and Chester will talk about that in the show. But him and I got together earlier this week that I'm recording this, which is the week before it comes out, uh, and talked about turkey. We did a turkey talk. Um, And I really think you're going to like the kind of things. This may be one of our best shows together that we've ever done. I'm just being quite honest. Both him and I said that after we got off the phone with each other um you know earlier this week and you know to me it's just about bringing you quality content things that you can take to the bank when it comes to information when it's stuff that you can you can use out in the field things that you can arm yourself knowledge wise when you're talking to other people about hunting and fishing and the outdoor stuff um you know i'm just i'm just a big fan of all this stuff i love it all and i just enjoy uh, sharing it with you guys through this medium and uh, format, and I just uh, I, I'm going to podcast every day I can podcast, so I just don't give up easily. So uh, anyway, this audience is growing slowly, but it's growing. Uh, I'm so excited again to have you guys on board, and just please tell a friend, hit the subscribe button, smash the notification button on YouTube if you're on there uh, or anything like that, and you can uh, you can check out our uh, our other content at fishgame.com and Digital World or our magazine in your local uh, stores via newsstand or uh, you can order you a copy at fishgame.com and get a copy delivered right to your mailbox anywhere in the United States. And thank you guys as well that listen outside of the United States and those of you guys especially that live outside of Texas. I really appreciate all of you guys tuning in as well. So recently, this past weekend, uh, March 31st was the day that I took my son, Jackson, who's nine years old. I've had him on the podcast before. Uh, I took him hog dog hunting. We won a trip through Hill Country Bowhunter Silent Auction. 
And uh, Hill Country Bow Hunters is a 3D uh, bow club, 3D archery club in uh, Liberty Hill, Texas, Seward Junction, the junction between 183 and 29, uh, Highway 29, just right up the road from where I live. Talked about them a couple of podcasts ago but because we were doing the fun shoot as an event and I was promoting the event. But um, really, really fun uh, a silent auction. We have it once a year. We typically have it in September, but I'm an officer there this year, and we had to, had to make it to uh, March because the – September event got rained out. So, um, you know, it was really a lot of fun, a lot of work, uh, but really a fun day. And uh, they had a hog dog hunt by this company called, or this outfitter called uh, Adrenaline Junkie Outfitters. And I love the name. That's really cool. And basically, I just decided to take Jackson on a uh, hog dog hunt uh, with nothing but a, a group of dogs, no guns allowed, no bows allowed, no crossbows allowed. Uh, just, uh, dispatch it with the old fashioned knife and uh, Bowie knife and, uh, basically, you know, just get out there and get it done. And, uh, it's kind of a, a more primitive style of hunting than a lot of guys are used to. It's kind of more hardcore and raw. Um, but the experience my son had, which I videoed and I've got the video up on YouTube right now. Uh, you just search for Dustin Jackson, uh, hog dog hunt and, Really, I just can't say enough about my kid, man. He really was a trooper. He got out there, and uh, we chased down a, a nice 250 or about 225 pound boar uh, with about two and a half inch cutters on both sides, and that sucker was huge, and he was not happy. And uh, Jackson got him. Uh, really, really fun hunt. Um, really ex ex excited about the fact taking a hog that big home, which we know how to make wild boar uh, into a uh, wide variety of different things. But, um, you know, uh, if you use a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of uh, white vinegar, uh, soak it a couple of days, the, the boar smell is not that bad. Uh, and I eat wild boar all the time, the big ones. Uh, they don't scare me at all when it comes to uh, the taste and everything like that because if you know how to prepare them right, it's usually not an issue. But uh, since this is a hunting episode, I just wanted to bring that up that I just can't say enough about Adrenaline Junkie Outfitters out of Taylor. Texas uh, frame switch, I think, is where uh, Jason's from, and Jason's just been a great part of um, of the uh, Hill Country Bow Hunters uh, silent auction thing, and I just really appreciate him giving us uh, opportunity to auction off one of his hunts, which I won. So it was really a lot of fun. He had a friend of his, Eric, that helped guide the hunt, and they both had their pig rigs and uh, four wheelers and uh, trailers, custom trailers with dogs and everything like that, just dog kennels and stuff. And it is really, really cool. So, anyway, look those guys up on Facebook. They have a Facebook page, Adrenaline Junkies Outfitters. And, um, you know, if you're interested in something fun in Central Texas as far as a, a hog dog experience, they specialize in youth and, and women. And uh, that's kind of cool that. They, uh, they have a specialty in, in, in the folks that aren't really the strongest or the hardest core hog hunters out there when it comes to hogs and dogs, but I thought that was kind of cool to mention. So Jackson did great. I've got the video up on YouTube, like I said, and then I've, he's getting a certificate from Chester Moore's new Boars program, B-O-A-R-S uh, scoring program. Uh, he will be the first entry in the open division of, um, of the, the, the open division of the hog scoring. And this boar was, uh, I believe, two and five eighths inch on one side and two and a half or two and four eighths on the other side as far as inches of that tusk, his bottom tusk. And man, man, that is just, I can't believe we got a trophy hog. I'm so excited about that. So this is a lot of fun. All right. Uh, before we get too far in the show, let's go to sponsors. And this week we have AccuSharp that is back up sponsoring the podcast again. Thank you, AccuSharp. You guys are awesome. Um, you know, AccuSharp eliminates the guesswork of using stones. I know a lot of you guys grew up using stones. Your dad or grandfather, my dad and grandfather both used stones on both sides of the family. Um, and uh, just three or four strokes with your AccuSharp and you're ready to go. It takes the guesswork out of not having to use stones to sharpen and get the right edge and get the right angle or, or honing steel or anything like that. This is just a simple no-brainer way to go. Buy one now at your local hardware store, order online, or buy one at Academy Sports and Outdoors. They carry a full line of AccuSharp products. And um, really, even Ted Nugent raves about the AccuSharp. He says, I run my AccuSharp blade sharpener over my small outdoor edge fillet knife, and all I can say is stand back. It is easy to use, easy to buy, and inexpensive, so inexpensive that you can have nothing to lose. Test it for yourself, sharpening your knife all the way from your kitchen, garage, and kayak, all your knives, 
Same results every time. Buy one at your local nearest hardware store or order online or buy at Academy Sports and Outdoors, like I said earlier. The neat thing about these is that they're so durable. I've got one that I've had for, I want to say, 14 years, 15 years now, and uh, I'm probably going to replace the carbide um, you know, the carbide, uh, sharpening edges in it. And basically, uh, you know, just keep it going, man. I'm just, I, I love, I love my AccuSharp. I've got a blue and white one that my dad gave me originally years and years ago. I've talked about it on the podcast. And then, um, you know, I've got several other AccuSharp products I've had over the years. I love knife sharpeners. I always keep my knives sharp every time I work around. And I tell you what, something again, really, really dull a knife is a big old hog. And I definitely was using my AccuSharp this past weekend, uh, cleaning that big old boar. Um, so anyway, good stuff. Uh, AccuSharp.com. That's A-C-C-U-S-H-A-R-P.com forward slash buy dash now or just AccuSharp.com and you can click on the outdoor products or the buy now tab and you can find out where to buy your own sharpener. All right. Thank you, AccuSharp, for sponsoring this podcast. We love you guys. All right. So um, this next segment, I'm going to talk a little bit about turkey, gun, turkey hunting and, and gun hunting and bow hunting. If you're looking for a real um, challenge in the woods as far as it goes, try turkey hunting with a bow or a crossbow <laughs> because they're a spooky bird. Uh, you know, when it comes to, they're very rare, a wary opponent when it comes to, uh, you know, hunting them in the woods. Uh, I would not recommend hunting with a bow for your first turkey if you're just starting out turkey hunting. I've been at it for years. Um, not killed a ton of turkeys, but um, I uh, I definitely use a shotgun if uh, if I can't use a bow. And um, you know, it's just kind of just kind of your preference. But basically, there's a lot of different load manufacturers out there that make shotgun loads for turkey. There's a lot of great gun manufacturers that make three and a half inch magnums. Do you need a three and a half inch magnum to kill a turkey? No. But there's a lot of different concepts and, and thoughts and everything behind turkey hunting. There's a huge following, and Chester will talk about that in his part of the show because, man, it's just a crazy thing. But typically, run and gun hunting, spot and stalk, uh, spot and call, or not stalk and call is what I'm going to say. And uh, just really having fun um, in the outdoors and in the woods. It is really hunting on foot. It is really hunting on the on the run and on the go. And uh, turns out, as I said on one of the last podcasts, that uh, turkey loads work pretty well on rattlesnakes because we will probably run across a rattlesnake or two as the spring moves on and it gets warmer and uh, they start moving around a little bit more. It was pretty cold this past weekend and I was out uh, hog hunting with my son, but uh, with dogs, but basically, uh, just, just be careful out there. And there's a lot of different, you know, uh, things that you got to watch out for. One of the things that I watch out for as well in the deep woods is mosquitoes. And I use a thermosel since turkeys can't smell that, but that well. And even with deer, I've shot one of the biggest deer of my life, uh, with a thermosel going on 20 yards away from them. And basically, um, you know, thermosel, I'm not doing a commercial or anything for them, but basically thermosel makes the, uh, the insect repellent, uh, pads that you put on a little warmer that's propane, um, uh, powered or butane powered. I forget what it is. I think it's propane or no, it's, it's butane. It's a little butane cartridge, I believe. Anyway, um, really fancy. You know, a lot of guys have never even heard of a thermocell, but they're, they're, they're a godsend when it comes to, um, saving your, your bacon in the, um, in the turkey woods or the deer woods in the early fall or whenever it's warm and those mosquitoes get to biting and uh, it's just miserable hunting stationary in a stand with uh, with the mosquitoes buzzing around you and gnats buzzing around you and uh, there's nothing you can do about it except for wear some camo netting or whatever and keep yourself you know protected from them but I hate mosquito bites and so that's why I always use a thermosel when I'm running the gun for turkey so uh, and basically the one thing I wanted to give you as a tech tip before we get into Chester's part is uh, really being safe when it comes to, to you know handling guns and being around your kids and your family and your dads or your father-in-laws or whoever you're hunting with, your grandparents, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, being safe with guns and stuff like that, but also being thinking like a turkey. And I, what I mean like that is uh, making sure there's no cover that's out of your way. Uh, that Well, not, not, not even that. Basically saying that... Um, when you're turkey hunting, you want to think the the level of a turkey, and I don't mean level wise as far as smarts, but level wise as far as they're they're down on the ground, and we're up six feet tall. If you're six feet tall or shorter, or long or taller than that, um, we don't think like they do. We don't see things the way that they do. So what I do is even get on the ground and look around when I'm doing a setup or any kind of decoy, you know, spread or anything like that with uh with turkeys and see what they're going to see at their level at their height level which is right off the ground 
And uh, basically, you know, if there's any obstructions uh, where they can't come into the decoys, if they if there are any obstructions where you, where I was getting to at a minute ago, where you can't shoot, that's another consideration to make to set up your turkey decoys and set up your turkey, um, you know, uh, your 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 turkey ambush points uh, where it is easy for turkeys to get to and easy for you to shoot from, as far as not having anything in your way when you're trying to make your shot with a shotgun. So. Just some food for thought there, and just a couple of turkey tips from your buddy Dustin here. And um, really, 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 really uh, appreciate you guys uh, tuning into this show. Here's my interview with Chester Moore. I think you're really going to enjoy what we have to say. Here we go. Joining me on the phone, Mr. Chester Moore, wildlife, uh, the wildlife journalist. So excited to have you back on the show, as always. One of the things that's, that's really exciting to me this time of year, especially as editor-in-chief of Texas Fishing Game Magazine, is the fact that it is wild turkey season. It is turkey season here in Texas and in much of the United States of America. Yes. And although I haven't done a lot of turkey hunting, it has always been something I like to write about and that I like to do when there was that opportunity. So right. uh, one thing I've learned is for sure is that turkey hunters are hardcore and dedicated. And I think the things that you and I are going to talk about on this podcast, I know you're going to drag some good stuff out of me as a skillful <laughs> interviewer that you are, uh, is going to be – unique for turkey hunters to hear yeah and that's the thing i was thinking about this morning before we started recording i was thinking maybe the duck hunters are as passionate if not more passionate but it's hard to find a group of people that love it as much as turkey hunters do yeah for sure you know duck hunters i'm a duck hunter myself wrote my book texas waterfowl shameless plug in fishgame.com uh you know definitely passionate i come from more of that background uh, although i didn't duck hunt until i was like 19 right uh i did it for many years uh, but what I think the difference with the turkey guys is this, is there is still that contingent of duck hunters that are very limits driven. Yes. And I've met more turkey hunters who just want, want to try their best to get that gobbler and that's the experience. So I think that may be the difference, but they're both really passionate. Well, it's, I don't want to say the word adversary, but it, it's a worthy opponent because a turkey's got like a four power binocular built into his, 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 his head, you know, as far as eyes yeah. go, uh, he yeah. can see, all, you know, all the way around him in a lot of cases, if he turns his head and stuff and, you know, has, has a wide, wide range of view. Um, if it, I've heard some people say if turkeys could smell, you know, we'd really be in trouble because they, they are yeah. really, I mean, just amazing ant creatures. Yeah, they, they're, they're stunning, and um, I have a project that I began this year. This is a long-term project. It's called Turkey Revolution. It's a personal Chester Moore crusade to raise awareness to turkey uh, conservation and hunting. Uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that Texas Fishing Game and it has the Turkey National e-newsletter. We starts a three-part newsletter this year, probably going more next year, to help spread the word on turkey conservation. But what I'm doing with the revolution is uh, starting off this year trying to get – like full frame award winning quality turkey photos of the Grand Slam, which is the Eastern, the Rio Grande, the Merriams, and the Osceola, all in 2019. Oh, goodness. And let me tell you something it has been a project already. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I'm doing this on my own time, on my own coin. There's no right. help from anyone. Um, and so I have to go when I have free time, which doesn't exist. Exactly. But I know the just feeling. to give you this, uh, the only ones I've tried so far are oh, Eastern here in East Texas, which is like a needle in a haystack, by right. the way, um, and Rio Grande. And let me start with the Eastern. Um, I've already made three trips, spent three days, uh, a total of about, by the time I hit the field, probably about 22 hours. Yep. Um, and I spent about 150 bucks in gas yeah. and I've seen zero birds. Hmm. That's the way it goes yes. sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking like, you know, there are guys who are out here hunting, um, Easterns in, in East Texas. And we'll talk more about that story, but what a challenge that is. A, you mentioned worthy adversary and I'm like, my Lord. So I thought, you know, what I need to do is shift gears at first here because I'll have the opportunity a little bit later to travel into some States where there are more Easterns. Uh, matter of fact, I've uh, got a line on some birds in, in Louisiana, which isn't a great turkey state, but there's a line on some birds someone's been monitoring over there. So I shifted my attention to Rio Grande. 
and a ranger from uh, Palmetto State Park, which is in Luling. Yeah, I've been there um, before. Yeah, kind of on the fringe of of the current best Rio Grande range. It's not known as a turkey area, but he said, "Hey, I saw thirty birds crossing the state park road into a field oh, a couple cool. of weeks ago. We see birds fairly frequently." So I was on a trip to go to Buckner uh, Camp Buckner for Buckner Children's Village doing some ministry work with my animals, me and my buddy Cole, and uh, I met him out there. And we hit the back roads that lead into the park where there's a lot of creek bottoms and stuff. And I saw one turkey. At about 175 yards, <laughs> it stood there for about one second, and boom, it was gone. Yeah. So I thought, well, driving between Luling and Marble Falls in the afternoon, there ought to be opportunities to find turkeys out in the fields. Yeah, dude, we hit areas, we cruised back roads, we did not see a bird. And it, I would say two of the counties we were in were the top, some top five counties for turkeys in right. Texas as well. So that shows you how crazy. So last week, went out to uh, my buddy Razor Dobbs, Razor Dobbs Alive, uh, his ranch outside of Kerrville. And he had just seen turkeys a couple of days earlier, strutting on the main road of his ranch and sees them pretty dang frequently. Kerr County is a good turkey county. And uh, we cruised all evening looking at his place, he even corned up roads. And there's pastures and there's a lot of open land in certain areas. Didn't even see a sign of a bird. So I'm like, oh, man, this is absolutely crazy. And um, so the next day, we, I'm going to uh, see my friend Debbie Hagebush out at YO headquarters to do some photography of some animals. Debbie's great. Her. I love her. She's wonderful. She's great, man, including her new baby, uh, including her new baby draft, yes. uh, which was mind blowing. But I said, you know, I said, can we cruise the roads, you know, look for turkeys on the way in? She said, absolutely. So I thought, well, because I've seen turkeys in the Y a lot, you know. Yeah. Well, Highway 41 down the, down, down the road there, you know, there's some back roads and those kind of things. You know, we kind of hit some area early before we had to go in. And uh, I, my buddy tells me, he says, you know, I never see turkeys right around this area when I go under my son's lease in Rock Springs. And I said, I've seen a lot of turkey on, on, in the 41 corridor. And about – Three seconds later, I said, stop the truck. And there's three hens on a hill right to our right. Mm -hmm. So I get him to back up. I shoot out the truck, jump behind some cedar bushes, and start shooting photos. And then on the other side of this little road, (laughs) and there are two gobblers so so sprung on those hens, they can't figure out how to fly over the fence like these hens obviously just did. (laughs) They're pacing back and forth. So I shoot photos. I'm like, I can't do a photo with the fence in the way. Right. So I run about 75 yards down and and kind of crawled on the fence line behind some cedar bushes. And they're right on top of me. When they get over, they get over, they're right on top of me. And I'm like, I can't even get a picture. I have a a 100 to 400 millimeter Canon lens. Wow. But when they finally get in photo range and position, I had to stick my camera around the bush. (laughs) (laughs) The stuff we do. When these birds are attempting to, they're so jacked up, they can't even figure out how to cross the road. Okay, yeah. they're still they're still pacing at this point, and I uh, and I and I shoot a bunch of pictures that way, and I look and I got them, and they finally they finally got across, and they're going after the hens. I jumped back over and shot one photo of him poking his head over the bushes and looking at me like, oh, there was a person there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, in the Rio Grande pursuit, I drove uh, twelve hours. <laughs> if you if you factor in well back and forth, twenty four hours. Right. Um, spent. Two hundred and fifty something dollars on hotel rooms, uh, and uh, a lot of time in the field. And I finally got, which is by far the best turkey photo I ever shot in my life. But this is the most common bird in Texas yes. by far, five hundred thousand Rio Grande. So right. just to show you that these birds are wary, wary birds, and they're an amazing game animal. You know, it's funny you said that. I was on a hog dog hunt with my son this past weekend. Uh, on Sunday morning, we're out in the field uh, getting ready to, to chase some hogs, and we see a turkey fly overhead. I don't see that every day. I mean, big wow, old you bird, don't. you know, just you flying overhead. And I'm like, maybe one of the dogs, you know, scared him up out of the bushes or whatever, but out of the roost. But it was so cool, just such a magnificent bird and such a, I don't want to say, you know, I – elusive i guess is the best way to say it because they are so wary of people and animals and things that they can that they're just they're just an amazing creature it just goes, it goes back to what i was saying earlier about being a worthy adversary because they as far as to hunt i mean it's it's hard to beat 
No question, man. That's really interesting. The only time I've seen turkeys just – I've never seen turkeys free-flying for no reason yeah. like that I didn't know of. Right. I've seen them fly out of a roost into a roost before, mm-hmm. uh, like you know, off the ground maybe 50 yards into a roost. I've seen that. Um, this one I've was booking turkeys. it, dude. I mean, he was. Was hauling. it a gobbler? It was a gobbler, was a gobbler? too. Yeah, absolutely. She's pulse, you're shot. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I didn't have a shot go with me. I was like, that would be cool. Shoot, shoot a turkey in the air, right? <laughs> you don't hear of that every day, right? <laughs> no, man. That would be the truth. You'd have to get a man full body flying. Right. Sure. Right. Exactly. Full body flying mount. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway that's nuts man yeah that's crazy but um so as far as turkey hunting tactics obviously you know we're talking full camouflage we're talking um you know run and gun you know for the most part as far as and that's what i was gonna talk about if i did the show by myself is just uh you know how to hunt them on the move and how to how to kind of shot gobble when you start out how to do a locator call and and you know then how to call them in um you know what are your what are your turkey tactics chester well, man, I am not like an expert call guy, but I'm pretty good with a, you know, a slate call. Yeah. You know, and I use um, a box get, call, but yeah, I know. Yeah, what you're you know, or a box call. I can do both. You know what I mean? And uh, I can actually do a pretty good hen yelp with my mouth. Right. And an okay gobble, mm-hmm. uh, uh, depending on how my if my throat's clear that morning. Right, right, right. right and yeah. uh, the, the Texas pollen isn't kicking my butt. <laughs> Yeah, here, like here. right now right but, next uh, to the oak tree man i know what you're feeling <laughs> so, yeah, it's insanity yeah. man it's like yellow over here it looks like salt <laughs> my wife calls it yellow death you know <laughs> so that's yeah, nuts anyway. man but that's that's part of the experience group and fighting on those elements you know and right when i the biggest bird i killed was a 26 pound rio with a 10 inch beard on racketville wow uh it was incredible. It was my buddy Lou Marillo, who is the hunting editor for, editor for Texas Fish Game. As a matter of fact, I'm working on booking my flight today to go to uh, New York to hunt eastern birds with him. Sweet. So really excited about doing that deal. There's a lot of easterns up there. That'll be my second bird of the Grand Slam on uh, with the shotgun. Mm-hmm. Uh, killed a bird with a bow before down on the King Ranch in about 1995 or six. And, um, you know, they're a, they're a cool bird. But see – the, the kind of what I've done, like a, a duck call, I, I hunt with guys who are incredible callers. And I've noticed that a lot of times calling in, in pressured areas has limited success. Yes. Uh, I'm all about location, 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 and setup. Mm-hmm. So what I like to do is I like to really scout an area and find where the birds have been out there strutting where there's a lot of, a lot of bird activity. If I don't see gobblers, that's fine this time of year. If I find hens, good, because the gobblers are going to be where the hens are. Yes. Kind of like a buck in the rut. You find the does, you find a high traffic area, there's yes. going to be bucks during the rut period, right? Absolutely. Uh, and one of the things I like to do is uh, like to utilize as much natural cover as possible. I use pop-up lines. The first one I ever used years ago was a double bull. Yep. Now you take a pop up blind and put it in the edge of a field with no with you know uh, for a white tail they're gonna look at you like you're an idiot. Yeah. You put a pop up blind, a turkey will strut three feet in front of it. Right. Sure. It's unbelievable. It's like a weakness to them. I've but the it. key is being camouflaged. So something we developed a few years back is what I call hunting like a ninja. There's yep. a story for this for Texas Fishing Game like an 05. I know. I've written about it, too. I've written about it because I've read your stories. On yeah, so like in the inside, the blind's black, right? So I wear all black. I wear a black I wear a black mask, and I paint around my eyes and everything black, uh-huh. black gloves. And essentially, with you know your your bows or your bow or shotguns, only gonna be up there just a second, right? Right. Uh, it renders you pretty much invisible to the turkey when you're in there. And the whole thing, in my opinion, is number two. You got to be quiet because turkey can hear pretty dang good too. Uh, but you just got to remain invisible to the bird. And it's all me about finding those transition zones. You know, I mm-hmm. found that gobblers, when they're like the ones I just encountered in Kerr County. When they're really hung up, man, they're gonna they're gonna act kind of stupid. And that's your one moment to get shot. But if they're on the fringe, they're just now coming into being ready to go, or they're suspicious or something like that. I like to find that I got a spot right in that open area where the hens are going to be feeding. But I like to hang close to a really, uh, I'm not going to say a super thicket like like a thorny thicket, but a spot where there's brush. Right. The spot was enough brush that bird can slip into real easy. And he'll feel safe. Because I've seen gobblers come in and out. They'll just boom, boom, boom. Something ain't right. And then they'll finally 
finally come in you know so uh it's about those strategic locations you know if you're hunting a rio grande rio grande's pretty much roost the same spot every night or in the same general area eastern birds will you gotta you gotta kind of like uh, call putting them to bed yeah. you literally have to go finding where they're roosting the night before and then set your calls, decoys, and hunts up in an area you think is going to be productive, where they can hear the calls, et cetera, or where they've been somewhere in the vicinity of that roost. Not too close, but close to the roost, because they may pack up and be a mile away the next day. Yes. So it's different. It's only two birds, only two subspecies I've hunted. But those are the differences in those birds, you know, and – um it's about, to me, locating whatever food source they're on. Like right now, I'm, the people in Louisiana have these easterns. There's still some acorns in this one particular area, and they're coming out into the edge of this nature trail. And uh, it's on a, on, a, on a person's property, and uh, they were getting these pictures every day and sending them to me. And I said, are you feeding or something? Go, no, no, they're just acorns that are still in this one spot that aren't, that aren't rotten. And uh, so it's locating those, 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 those feed opportunities those areas where the birds can strut, they like to be out in that open and strut where they can be seen. And I like finding that little tight corner somewhere where there's a little bit of cover those birds can go in and out of, you know, and just sitting and waiting. But it's locating populations of birds. Right. Uh, turkey, you know, you think about wild turkey in Texas. It's a bird. You know, think about how many doves there are in Texas. Just like there's millions of doves, right? Right. It's, it's really stunning. There's 500,000 turkeys. You got to figure that is scattered from about, let's just take Austin on all the way out to El Paso. Yes. 500,000 ain't that many. Right. Uh, it's spread it's out across in, Texas. Yeah. Right. All of it. Because you got to figure the same amount of habitat for whitetail has four times the whitetail. Yep. That's, That's not true. including the East Texas whitetail. That's so a good point. Um, they're, they're a little more scattered, and not every area that looks like it's going to have turkeys is going to have. That's one thing I found in, the, in this project. Um, I should be able to, on my turkey revolution quest, get turkeys, get real grand turkeys just outside of Houston, west of Houston. Mm -hmm. And there are probably a few birds in some of those creek bottoms, but there's nothing really to speak of. I had to travel an additional three plus hour, four hours west to find concentration of birds enough to make my quest successful. So that tells us there are still some real conservation challenges left for turkeys and really dusty. And I've been studying this a while, and this year it just really hit me. Um, actually, this is a funny story. It hit me around Christmas eating turkey for Christmas dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about turkeys yeah. and going – you know, there's just something different about their story. And I did even – give. And, and I tell you, Dustin, it's probably the most revealing wildlife conservation story I've heard in North America. Okay. Now, if you look at turkeys, turkeys have always been revered. As a matter of fact, Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, famously wrote that he didn't think the eagle was a great symbol of America because it was that. a damn scavenger. Yep. Yep, I've heard but that. But the turkey was so wary and so regal and such a uh, you know such an opponent that it was a Stoic. better yeah. rep representative. And, and while I think I like turkeys a lot, I have to disagree because I don't think the goblin turkeys are going to scare America's enemies. You know what I mean? Which is a screaming <laughs> the, eagle. The eagle, however, yeah, it's a different story. It doesn't yeah. quite work, but right. that shows you that in early Amer in early colonized America. The Native Americans were already in tap with this, of course. They, they were way ahead of everybody, right? Yeah, sure. But, but it was even these aristocratic Europeans looked at the turkey as a symbol. But what happened is you, you and I both know the sad legacy of unregulated hunting. Right. Um, hunting wasn't in the 1800s a trophy deal, although there was some trophy hunters. It was, a, it was an eating and a market hunt. Right. And then we brutalized the forest of the South and took out a lot of the great forest. And uh, then we started doing things like controlling fire. Right. And fire is vital to turkeys because turkeys don't do good in forest that's too thick. Right. They like to have some thick spots, but they have to have some open forest, like savanna type forest to thrive right. because predators will kill them. They don't hang good. So when you get the combination of bad habitat, the invasion of feral hogs, which eat ground nesting birds and, right. and eggs, destroy habitat. You get unregulated hunting. Then you get to a point in this, and, and there's really some debate on the exact number 
of turkeys that were, let's say, in around the 1950s or so. But there's any estimate between 100 and 300,000 turkeys in the entire United States. Mm-hmm. Which is, think about that. That's at 100,000, that's a fifth of what Texas has. Right, exactly. And I was actually talking to Toxie Hayes, who is the founder of Mossy Oak. Mm-hmm. And his grandfather was on a turkey hunting club, an original turkey hunting club, in one of the last strongholds of Turkey. That's where he grew up. Right. That's where his passion for supporting the National Wild Turkey Federation came from. Sure. It's an ma- amazing story. So what happened is that people started really concentrating on turkey and figuring out this is a great game, but we can't let it go. So into the National Wild Turkey Federation. I love this. They were founded in 1973, and so was Chester Moore. I was, yeah, there you go. I was, you were founded in 1973. Yeah. Uh, and – they have done such a magnificent job of helping facilitate what states and different agencies are doing to help wild turkeys and putting birds that were abundant in one area and transplanting them to other spots. Now we're at well over uh, about the four to five million turkeys in America, Mark. Right. Which is a vastly huge improvement. And um, it's, it's a fascinating story. There's been millions of dollars spent on it, but it is a wonderful comeback where most of their historic range turkeys are doing wonderful and they're advocating national wild turkey federation in texas alone has numerous biologists in the field trying to figure out the best habitat they're supporting bringing birds back there's an initiative to bring the eastern turkey back into the piney woods you know one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that three quarters of the grand slam lives in texas the rio grande of course the rio grande of course which is the, by far the most common. Yes. We're back at about 7,000 um, Easterns. Uh-huh. And I believe we're going to be three times that within a decade oh, in, in cool. East Texas. Yeah, I'm just, I've got high hopes for the new project sure. because of what Parks and Wildlife is doing. National Wild Turkey Federation I really believe we're going to see that bird come back at, another, at a new level. But in Western Texas, in my opinion, the most beautiful turkey, the Merriams, with their beautiful white tip feathers. Right. There's actually a popular isolated population of Marion's turkeys in the Trans Pecos. Huh. And so not only is my plan to get the Grand Slam, my t- plan with I, I probably won't be able to get it this year, but my plan is to get the Texas Slam. Yeah, the three. Yeah. At some point and I'm gonna get an Eastern in Texas this year. I believe that. But the Merriams, I've been told there's about five hundred pure Merriams left in Texas. Um, and we're, and we're digging into that for a story that's going to be coming up soon, but there's an area where there's Merriam's and Rio Grande hybrids. Right. Yeah. And I've, and I've also heard at Gus Engling wildlife management area, there are, Merriam, there are Eastern and Rio Grande hybrids. I've never heard of a hybrid Turkey. That's really cool, dude. I mean, yeah, I, there I are actually always... hybrids. There are wow. actually hybrids that are happening out there. And, uh, some people call them super turkeys, you know? Yeah. But it's an amazing thing. So, what a great testament to the North American model of hunter-based conservation yes. that people who hunted turkeys said, we got to have these great birds, and they're stocking the turkeys. The gold turkey, for example, you know, that's like the royal hunt. You get the grandson of the gold. The gold is an elusive mountain-based turkey. It's mainly in Mexico, but also was uh, previously fairly common in parts of Arizona and yep. Mexico. I was just going to bring and, that up. Yep. Yeah, and golds have been – Reestablished in Arizona, New Mexico, where there's seasons on them now, and uh, mm-hmm. there's even I've been had two, the, no, I've had three different people tell me they saw golds in Texas in the mountains. Uh, I don't know if that's actually Merriams they're seeing; right. they're very similar. But that's part of this five-year turkey revolution quest of mine is to let people know what's there. And I, and I get chills right now thinking about the great work that hunters and people who care about this is the best hunter-based conservation story that I know of. And it's so exciting to see this happen. And for the guy out there hunting, the reason I'm saying all this is because you're part of that. When you buy that license, that upland bird permit in Texas, part of that money is going back to Eastern Turkey restoration. And when you join the National Wild Turkey Federation or support like our friends in the Montgomery County chapter, join one of the chapters of the Texas National Wild Turkey Federation, you're helping putting birds on the ground. And it's habitat. And, and here's my whole reason really for doing this. I believe if we get habitat right for turkey, because yes. the white-tailed deer, you and I, you're, you're, the, you're the king of urban bull hunting. 
I am. Yeah, I guess you so. Have an urban bull mask. You and I both both know. <laughs> you might see a turkey or two in urban areas, but white tail could hang in urban areas. Yes. Turkeys can't thrive like that. Like a, they can't thrive without being at least very close to wild ground. Yes. And what's happened is with controlling fire, with planning different stuff, we screwed it up. But if we can get the habitat right for turkey and bring back what we had when uh, the native, the first nations were here, then I believe we will make America's forest healthy to be healthier for endangered species, for white tailed deer, and everything. So yes. it's really, a, a, it's really a, it's a quest born out of passion for conservation. And uh, what an exciting opportunity for uh, hunters out there to take part in this. Well, it's kind of like a broad spectrum too, Chester, because if we do, you know, good for the turkey, as you're saying, we do well for the other wildlife. And something that's a testament to you as a wildlife journalist is you actually went to the National Turkey Federation show this year. Yes, sir. And got to talk to all kinds of different companies that we've never heard of and all kinds of different, you know, conservation people. And the, the, the passion that people have for this resource is just amazing across the United States, but especially, you know, uh, chapters here in texas of nwtf and and just you know it's just to see that passion for this bird is just such a testament to conservation and just taking care of our resource absolutely man and that's why in the next five years in terms of game animals you know i have different conservation things that i work on but in terms of game animals my number one pursuit is going to be the wild turkey because of what it means for all wildlife yes. in America. Right? I never looked at it like that before, Chester, because I never looked at it like like being something that's good for everything if you get the turkey thing right, you know, well, you, I mean, you know in the you, simple you, terms. You know, what, you know what it hit me? I, I went to, I was already well, well down this path, but I went to the National Wild Turkey Federation Convention, met a, an awesome NWT biologist in Texas, Annie Farrell. And uh, Annie was talking to me about how fire, you know, I knew fire was, was a factor. And, uh, and we were talking about the Angelina National Forest. Yes. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, my God, there's controlled fires. They're everywhere. That makes sense. Why? There's Turkey. That's the area closest to me that's known to have Easterns. Uh -huh. And I went a couple of days later getting back and sat there looking for turkeys. I didn't see turkeys, but I saw signs everywhere that said National Wild Turkey Federation Texas Parks and Wildlife, no hunting in this part of the National Forest. It's an area that the the, the feds and the state have designated no hunting, but it's, it's a stronghold of stocking. It's like an area they can move out from there, right? Right. And I'm looking at this beautiful habitat that looks drastically different what's five miles down the road because it's been managed. And then I saw the other abundant wildlife there, and I'm going, man, if we get turkeys right, we can get a lot of this stuff right. It's about fixing the habitat. Right. And uh, it's incredible. You mentioned um, not knowing about the hybrids, which is to me was fascinating to discover myself. Yes. What about the white turkeys that we ran in the, in the Turkey National Newsletter? Yes. By the way, if you don't subscribe to Texas Fishing Games E Newsletter, you're missing out. You need yeah. to go to fishgame.com, sign up for the E Newsletter. You'll get the turkey. Next Turkey right. National comes out th comes out Friday. Well, the one you'll probably get by the time you hear this show will be out on the, I believe the th second Friday in uh, April. Third Friday in April, and uh, it's it's good stuff. But we have a story on the white turkeys. And we had a reader of Texas Fishing Games send a picture of a white Rio Grande with another Rio Grande and a turkey in Johnston City. Mm -hmm. And I went to the NWTF convention, and there's a mounted Osceola in a smoke phase, which yes. is you know, uh, which is incredible. You know, um, uh, it's uh, it, it's incredible to see any of these morphs. Like if you see something like that, that really catches your attention, right? You know, and Flambo have out that uh, that Smoky Baby, which uh -huh. is their 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 decoy. Because you know what, what I've what I've learned in nature is anything in a species is different is absolutely uh, beat down or attacked by other species. I saw one time on a ranch a bison get shot, and the other bison attacked it when it was shot. Oh wow. I have a friend of mine's ranch, and he has there's some free ranging turkeys that don't know if they're domestic, wild, or in between, right? They're just roaming around, and they've never been, never been hunted, right? They're, they're they've never been shot at. They don't know anything, right? And there's one with a crippled leg that I've seen on there multiple times, getting beat up by the other turkeys. <sighs> wow. An anomaly. So the idea with Flambo had is putting this thing out there to grab the attention of the others, but I see 
different things in nature immediately get hammered. So to me, that went, oh, that's playing on that response of like, in the natural order, this doesn't work. We're going to eliminate. There's a, there's a thing to eliminate that, right? Right. So that was fascinating to me, and kudos to Flambeau for such an amazing decoy. But smoke phase, uh, Osceola turkey, which was you know, probably somebody pay a hundred thousand dollars to go hunt that thing. Oh yeah, you know that's a specialty bird, yeah, for sure. And then and then I had a feathered frenzy farms in Lufkin has pure strain of eastern turkeys. You know, people raise those. You know. And they've had them for years, and they, they read my article in, in the e-newsletter uh, before we had the Turkey National, just one of my odd turkeys, right? Yeah. And they said, you got to come see our birds. They've been raising these for years in the same clutch of eggs. And the, I've seen where these birds are nothing can get in and breed them. Right. They had red face, and they had a, several smoke face born. I got to photograph those. Wow. And uh, it was incredible. And I was so excited to see that. And so I did some digging. And what biologists are saying now is that look at domestic. See, turkeys haven't been domesticated that long. Right. You know, they're talking about this European domesticated turkeys. Yeah, when the settlers came and got turkeys from America and brought them to Europe. Right. 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 So anything you see color wise in a domestic breed, whether it's our famous bourbon red, whether it's a royal palm, which is white and black, can be possibly in the genetics of the wild turkey. Interesting. So, yeah, so uh, it's it's a really, really cool thing, and I've had so many people excited about it and stuff like that, and that's why I'm so honored and privileged to be editor-in-chief of Texas Fishing Game. So when Chester Moore has a crazy idea to sport turkeys, <laughs> they're, they're throwing the newsletter out. And, uh <laughs> But it's it's a good thing, and there's so much of a story to be told because now I'm trying to get my grand slam. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and and to your testament of the newsletter, I mean, I, I love what, reading the turkey newsletter stuff that you've got going on here in the Whitetail National, all the special newsletters because. I mean, there's really a, uh, and I, I talk about the newsletter every single show, Chester. I want you to know yeah. that because I love the work you're doing over there. And I, I talk about you doing that work just about every Thank show you. as well. But, but but it's just, it's stuff you don't see everywhere. It's, it's stuff that's unique content that you're not going to run across in just any other publication, you know? No, I mean, and we're... Yeah. And I, can, I, can I give a teaser for sure, something? Sure, sure, sure. I'm ready. We bring the Whitetail National back in September. I've got something on a whitetail that's going to blow people's minds. I love it. And it's kind of related to what we're talking about with turkey and different turkeys and stuff. It's so cool. And uh, that's going to come up in April. And it involves kinds of whitetails you've never heard of. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fun stuff, man. But, you know, the Grand Slam, you know, the Osceola only in basically below, basically considered pure Osceola below Tallahassee in Florida. Yes. Anything up there is either a hybrid or in the northern Florida or just a pure eastern. The Merriams, I mean, well, God, what a beautiful bird. And we have a few of those in West Texas. That goes up from uh, Nebraska, part of Nebraska. So Nebraska has eastern, same thing we had. Nebraska has Rio Grande, eastern, and Osceola. Uh, I mean, in the Osceola, I'm sorry, Merriams. And you got all the, all the western states. But you know, there's been Rio Grande years ago stocked in a lot of western states. Mm -hmm. There are Rio Grandes in Hawaii. Oh, wow. I did not know that. That's cool. So there are wild turkeys now in Hawaii. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, just crazy, crazy stuff, man. And, uh, I mean, just, you know, what a, what a great challenge. Uh, my goal is to get the grand slam and, uh, my goal, the first go around is I'm going to get it with shotgun. Mm -hmm. And then my second round is going to be with a bow only. Oh, cool. That's good. And that's kind of my goal. I, I've already got Maria. I'll get, uh, hopefully, I'll get an Eastern this year. And then next year, we're going to work on a Merriam's and an Osceola. Uh, and uh, may, maybe I'll get my Eastern and my Rio next year with the bow and kind of have both going. You know what I mean? But uh, I got to I gotta give a buddy of mine a plug. My buddy Matt Ott and Ott and Brothers Taxidermy is uh, working on some turkey stuff for me. And he's just doing some killer, killer stuff out there in Bernie with uh, birds and, and stuff like that. And uh, me and him are kind of collaborating on some crazy turkey projects to raise awareness to conservation and tax journey too so that'd be kind of cool you know no, that's great uh, and and another turkey story for you real quick when i was hunting at a uh, place that i hunt at deer at in mason this year i was hunting or last year i was hunting with a gentleman that uh, that owns that property out there and he is just a master turkey hunter and so we hunted all weekend two different properties in mason and brady 
and I could hear them off in the distance, but they would never come into a call. I would actually do a run and gun, and we did a blind setup at a tank where they'd come over, you know, the tank and and everything, and see the uh, and see the decoys and stuff. Had decoys and everything else out. The moment I left, I'm rolling out of the house and everything. I get a text message from him. He sends me a picture of a of a gobbler that's walking within ten yards of the back porch of the house with his beard dragging on the ground, dude. And, you know, I was just like, I hunted all weekend and here this turkey just comes strutting along, you know, like nobody's business, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, God bless it. Why not me? You know, that's, that's the that, way it happens. That's, that's the way it goes. Story, they were like giving you the feather or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Like, that's right. They were like, no, nah, no, give me the beard. They're like, that's no, right. Give no, me the beard. No, yeah. no, no. I'm going to strut while you're not here. You don't have a shot going <laughs> Everybody's like, why didn't why didn't your uh, landowner shoot it? I was just like, it, it, you're missing the point of the story, man. I hunted all weekend for the turkey, and here he comes. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah. so that it just drove me it. crazy. But you gotta love it, you know. So that's just the part of hunting, you know. That's just why they call it hunting and not killing, I guess, and not shooting. So yeah, it, it's it's a beautiful experience, and it's something really really unique. And um, we have a lot that we can do better for turkeys in Texas. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that could be hunting turkeys right now. They're not taking advantage of their deer leases in the right. spring season. They could add a lot of joy to their lives and challenge to their hunts and sure. do something totally unique. And um, if you're a bow hunter, I challenge you right now to go out and shoot a turkey with your bow. It is an incredible challenge. I've taken one with the bow years ago. And uh, it's an incredible, incredible challenge. Lou Marillo, editor in Chief Texas Fishing Game, that's his thing. He is a master of it. Uh, and uh, if you want some information on what to do, you can reach out to Lou. And uh, but I'm telling you right now, man, a lot of great stuff with turkey. A majestic, majestic bird that symbolizes America, that symbolizes the wilds and woods of America. You see deer a lot, but when you see that big old red head, Yep. Out in the distance, and you see those those feathers fan out. You know, you're old and wary. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, any animal sighting is an exciting moment, but those turkey sightings to me just seem a little bit wilder than some of the other things we pursue. And I think that's what's got me so motivated about them. And I know that's what got so many people who are so much more experienced the actual hunting of turkey than me. But I tell you what. It is a bird that I have come to have greatly respect, and I'll kind of wrap up my little part of this with this. When I was a kid, you know, I, I, I've talked many times about my scrapbook, and me and my dad would sit on sit in his lap, and I would we cut up old sports field and field and streams and outdoor life. Right. And I would make scrapbook stuff. I want to go hunt or just want to go photograph or whatever. And I have two of these scrapbooks left. I lost my fishing one, unfortunately. That makes me want to cry. I had one with all kind of crazy fishing pictures, you know. But I had this hunting one, and it had a wild turkey in it. And I thought wild turkey were cool, man. I'm like, I don't know. They have wild turkeys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And I hunted in East Texas, and I knew from reading my books they were supposed to be here, but I never saw one. Well, I go out to Lano for the first time. And my uncle had killed a turkey on the same day least a year before and i thought that was like someone shooting a white whale like you know i was like oh my god i was like my god it's moby dick what a, <laughs> and i saw turkeys for the first time and i went wow there actually are wild turkeys right right they're, they're really they're really wild birds how cool is that and i never saw it one until years later uh i was only 12 at the time but i saw them and i come back to east texas and i looked at my own forest and go why aren't they here and then I, at that time, Parks and Wildlife was doing their initial stocking of eastern birds. And it gave me hope that yeah. one day we would have those birds here. Mm -hmm. And there were some problems with turkeys since then. And I think they're fixing some of that. They're learning more. But I think that if we can all get back to that feeling the 12-year-old me had when he saw that turkey for the first time. Oh, yeah. I think we'll be better sportsmen, appreciate our resources, and appreciate the sacred time we spend in God's outdoors. Absolutely. I mean, what what better way to wrap this up? I mean, it's just it's about conserving that resource, but also that feeling. That's why we all hunt, you know. That's uh, it. It's just kind of like you know, it, it kind of like fishing and getting a hold of a shark or something like that on on the line. But I mean, you know, as far as the 
the the rush that you get the adrenaline kick that you get in from having a big turkey walk in on your setup um you know it's just there's not another sport that i know of in the united states or beyond that 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 rivals that amount of fun you know i mean yeah, i don't know how else to say it but that's you it, know it's good stuff pigs are a close second for me yes but uh but uh far as just a, a unique experience it's really hard to make happen i think turkeys take it yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. So uh, anything else to, uh, how can people get a hold of you, Chester? I haven't given you an opportunity to do that yet, and then we'll close this bad boy out. Uh, easiest way is to go to chestermore.com. Uh, you'll kind of see all the stuff we got going on. You can contact me there and ask questions, and you know whether it's for Texas Fish Game or radio stuff, whatever you want to do. And if you have anything, any crazy turkey photos of multiple beards or huge beards or yeah. long spurs or white turkeys or smoked turkeys or hybrid possibly or questions, email me, chester at chestermore.com. Chester at chestermore.com. And thank you, Dustin, for the privilege of being on your podcast. I love it. Always a pleasure to have you, Chester. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, sir. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chester Moore, Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center, and uh, – <laughs> Uh, editor-in-chief Texas Fishing Game, just an incredible, incredible guy. I just love having this guy on the show, and uh, every time we get together, it's kind of like reunited, and it feels so good. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but basically, we, we we really enjoy each other's company and, and seeing each other at these shows and uh, just talking to each other on the phone You know, a few times a week. Uh, Jester and I really, really have a great relationship as far as uh, editor and, and uh uh, an associate publisher in my case go um but just really a good work relationship and a, and a good um you know friendship as well so i really have a lot of good things to say about him love the heart on that guy he really has a heart for conservation and i love the um passions that he has in life it's not just about catching and killing for him it's about wildlife preservation and uh the youth and the next generation that's inheriting all this stuff and man that just that is right up my wheelhouse kind of like the deal we did on the last podcast where we talked about uh coastal brigades and texas brigades and the the different wildlife things that they do conservation they do with teenagers from you know 13 to 17 years old and man that just that stuff just makes my socks go up and down i love it all right so thank you guys so much for uh tuning in and please please if you've not done so already subscribe to our newsletters they are free and you get a new one every tuesday wednesday and thursday of tactical and practical tuesday you have wildlife wednesday and you have thursday the texas state of the outdoor nation plus you have bonus newsletters like the whitetail national and the um the uh turkey national i believe is what the turkey ones call it. i may be wrong but chester's whole deal is turkey revolution and that's what i've named this podcast today is a uh, turkey revolution because it is really a revolution in a lot of different ways of what he's trying to do with the whole conservation element because again like he was saying if you fix turkeys you fixed a lot of things uh, if you fix the habitat issue for turkeys if you fix uh, you know, wildlife uh, preservation as far as wildlife um, resource preservation uh, with turkeys. You fixed a lot of things. And man, that just, like I said earlier in the show, this is just one of my favorite podcasts with him because we really, really hit it off well. <laughs> and I, th I hope you enjoy this. So thank you so much. Please tell a friend. Please share this podcast on social media if you haven't done so already. It's, again, free for you to do that. And uh, we'd love to have as many listeners as we can get. I'm just happy to have you guys uh, chiming in and uh, telling a friend. Please also, if you've not done so, go to wherever you have found this podcast, especially if you're on iTunes, if you're on Stitcher, if you're on uh, Spotify, if you're on um, uh, iHeartRadio, any of those, you can rate the podcast on a lot of these platforms. And if you give us a five-star rating, more people can find the show about the best of the outdoors and Texas fishing game and, uh, and learn more about this stuff like you are. Uh, and I hope you're learning a lot because I'm here to teach you as much as I know and as much as the guests that are bringing to the show know. And I just, I'm fascinated about the outdoor stuff, guys. I know some of you guys are too, which is why you listen. Uh, and I appreciate that so much. Each and every one of you guys that tune into this podcast, y'all mean the world to me. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I really do. So thank you guys so much for watching, reading, and listening. Have an awesome day in the outdoors. We'll see you next time. <laughs>